Thank you, Anna. Hi, everyone. I'm Hanovi Schoonover, the Training and Resource Coordinator for Redwind Consulting, and I will be the Redwind host for this webinar. So today, we will be going over securing housing options for participants. Joining me today is Victoria Ibanez, the Executive Director of Redwind Consulting. Victoria is of the Navajo and Apache tribe and has been working to end violence against American Indian and Alaskan Native women for 30 years. She developed and has been the Executive Director for Redwind Consulting for, since 2005 and has been coordinating and providing tribal technical assistance for recipients of the Tribal Governments Program for the U.S. Department of Justice Office on Violence Against Women. Current projects include the development and implementation of tribal-specific shelter and transitional housing programs and assisting tribal programs in development and program delivery. And I will now turn it over to her. Thanks, Anovi. Well, welcome, everybody. I'm glad you could join us today. Um, and I just wanted to add a little bit to my background from what Hanovi has said. Um, in addition to the work that he described, I've also um, been involved in the development of um, three transitional housing programs over the years, as well as an emergency shelter. So I've, I've got a, a quite a large range of experience in the work um, that I've been doing providing technical assistance. Um, so let's just go ahead and get started. So I wanted to start off by talking a little bit about housing and homelessness because I think it's important we understand how that all plays out in the mix of this. And so when we look at some of the statistics up there that basically we're talking about half of all women um, that are homeless um, I identify as um, having experienced domestic violence as an immediate cause for their homelessness. And that's huge when we think about it, particularly for our Native populations, because we have higher rates of um, domestic violence um, experienced by our Native women. And within our tribal communities, we have much more limited housing, housing opportunities. So I would expect that as we look at the homeless population that we would have even larger numbers. And homelessness looks a little bit different within our tribal communities as well. And I'll talk a little bit about that in a couple minutes. Um, so we also have 84% of homeless women have experienced severe physical or sexual abuse in some point at, at some point in their life. So thinking about that from a homeless perspective, that um, the, the level of violence has been um, quite severe, um, so that adds to a lot more trauma um, that victims are experiencing. And 63% of homeless women have been victims of intimate partner, to partner violence as adults. So when we think about 50% say that they're homeless because of their domestic violence, and then we have 63% who have said, who, of homeless women who have said that they've been victims. The other thing in there that I think is important to acknowledge is that oftentimes we have ideas of what homelessness looks like to us. So some people may have this perception of being a homeless person as somebody who is living on the streets. And um, when we think about homelessness and how it um, frequently looks in Indian country, we actually see a lot more couch surfing and overcrowding. Um, in, in, um, in temporary living situations so that people are bouncing from house to house to house so they're not necessarily on the streets. And we see that as a frequent um, way that homelessness looks for women as well, that there's a lot of movement in temporary housing situations. So they may stay with a friend for a few weeks or a month or two, maybe stay with a relative for a few weeks or a month or two, and move around. And because of that, um, some people may not identify themselves as homeless um, because that may not meet the perception of what they're calling homeless in their minds. The other thing that's really important for us to recognize is that um, children, so as we look at survivors of domestic violence, 
that many of the survivors that we're, look at, we're working with have children with them. And so um, in this um, statistic here, this is by the age of 12, 83% of homeless children have been exposed to at least one serious violent event, and nearly 25% have witnessed acts of violence within their families. Um, so I also want to put some context to that as well. So thinking about 25% of homeless children saying that, and we go back to um, the other data of um, 50% of women identifying that they're homeless as a result of the violence, and then 63% of homeless women having been victims of intimate partner violence. So when you think, when you look at this statistic for children, um, that 25% have witnessed acts of violence within their families, that's a very low number. And what we know is that often survivors believe their children were asleep or did not see the violence. Um, and that would lead us believe, to believe that that 25% is severely low um, because it's the adult who's reporting the information about that. So when we think about housing, um, there's a lot of different challenges, and particularly as we look at Indian country and the challenges that we have in Indian country um, that one of our biggest challenges is that we have really limited housing stock, which as we're providing transitional housing, um, we often need to look at the housing that's um, surrounding our, our tribal lands. Um, and so with that, one of the things that we'll hear is that landlords will say that they don't want to work with victims of domestic violence. and. Um, and they believe that domestic violence victims are going to be poor tenants, that things are not going to work out. They have perceptions that there may be property damage, there may be a police presence as a result of the violence, and there's going to, they, they believe that there will be a high likelihood that, um, that the unit that they're renting may be um, left unexpectedly or unplanned, which actually for them, um, one of their big concerns is that um, turnover in, the, in, a, in an apartment or housing is one of the highest costs that a landlord experiences. So when they believe that there's going to be that unexpected vacancy, um, their concern is going to be that they're going to have to deal with uh, additional costs with that. Um, they also think about um, that there's going to be costly repairs to the unit. So thinking about a domestic vi violence survivor, so they're going to have perceptions that through that violence that that apartment or housing is going to be damaged. Um, and they're concerned about um, that that survivor may not have the ability to um, pay the cost of, of, of living in that unit. Um, they're also concerned about, um, um, well, you know, they're also concerned about the abuser returning in the picture. And when we think about that, that's not an uncommon situation because most of the time when we are working with survivors, we really recognize that a survivor more frequently wants the violence to stop and doesn't necessarily want to leave the relationship at that point in time. So there is a likelihood that that abuser may come back into that, into that survivor's, into that survivor's um, life. Um, so that could be a concern for um, the landlord as well. Um, so another um, challenge is around unsafe neighborhoods um, that might com com compromise the goal of achieving safety. And when we think about that, when we, and we go back to thinking about limited housing stock and affordability of housing for survivors, a big challenge has to do with the fact that when you find housing that's affordable, it may not be in the neighborhood where people want to be. So they may be in positions where it may not be a safe environment for them, 
or in some cases they may be more isolated because they're away from family or friends or um, more accessible to an abuser. So choices, when we look at poverty and how that plays out, choices for a survivor may be, may be limited um, based on poverty and uh, the limited resources that they may have. Um, and then another point in here around housing identification is that domestic violence can have a significant negative impact on a survivor's economic standing. So what we do know as, is that as a direct result of the abuse and how that played out is that survivors may have ruined credit. Um, you know, the, the abuser may have um, taken credit cards out in their name or may have used their credit cards, the, the survivor's credit cards, and ran up, ran up debt. And then when the relationship ended, the burden of responsibility on that debt fell, fell on the survivor when they didn't have um, the resources to cover that. Um, as a result of the abuse, there may have been a lease violation or eviction um, that had played out in, in the, her past. And then also um, that survivor may have had challenges around employment. Um, what we do know about um, domestic violence and the tactics of domestic violence, one of those is economic abuse. And a survivor um, may frequently deal with harassment at work from the abuser or different things that interfere with her to be able to be um, present at work, either emotionally or physically present and have or have her workday being disrupted by the abuser, which then can give her a negative impact on her employment history. So she may end up having lost a job or have negative um, views of her performance at work as a result of that um, abusive relationship. And so these raise red flags um, for a landlord. So when they say that um, they're concerned about working with a survivor, there's all these different reasons and they're trying to manage um, their, the housing stock that they have available um, for rent. Um, they're trying to manage that with their resources um, and want to do, do that in a way that protects their best interests. So, They've got a lot of different assumptions. Some of that is founded and some of that are rooted in, in myths. Um, so it's important for them to, um, to have, um, for us to work with them in ways so that we can educate them. So when we think about um, working with landlords um, and addressing that view that domestic violence survivors are, would be a poor tenant and a poor risk, um, we want to educate landlords about the dynamics of domestic violence so that they have some understanding that it's not the survivor's responsibility as, as a part of that. We also want to communicate with the landlord about the, about the strong incentives survivors have to maintain their rental agreements to ensure their ongoing safety and stabilization. Um, and also um, offer coaching and preparation for survivors um, to have conversations on their own behalf. So that's one of the roles that we can take on to help support survivors in their communication with, um, with the landlords. So as a best practice, um, safety, safety and privacy is going to be really an important part of it. And as we do the education with landlords, we want to be cautious, just as we are in every aspect of our work, that we never compromise survivors' um, privacy um, and that when, and when we communicate with them that we're doing it with an informed consent um, to make sure that um, the survivor is in a place of wanting us to share information. Um, but we can also do that education in a broader sense so that we're not talking specifically about this one ten tenant, but helping that landlord to understand the bigger picture around working with survivors. Um, we also, as we think about um, honoring survivors' choices, um, we, we really want to recognize that 
um, it's their choice um, about where they're going to live. They're the one who has to live there on a day-to-day -day basis. And um, we want to work with that survivor to help them um, if they're looking at locations that may make them um, more vulnerable or have more challenges to where the abuser might identify their location. Um, and so in, in this process, with the survivor in the lead and in um, consultation, um, we want to make sure that we're frequently updating their safety planning that includes strategizing around um, the possibility of the, of the abuser um, showing up and sabotaging um, or being around and, and how to have contact um, if the survivor wants to have contact with them without endangering their housing. Um, and so I think about one of, the, one of the frequent things that happens is a survivor will allow that abuser to move back in. And as a part of that, um, we want to work with that survivor on how to live with that abuser safely. What are the strategies for safety within a situation like that? Um, while having those candid conversations about the risks, and then also having the conversations with that survivor about how that might create a problem within the housing and how it might be important for that survivor to communicate with her landlord and inform the landlord that um, her um, partner, uh, we, she doesn't necessarily need to call him her abuser, um, but her partner is now living with her. Um, and so as a part of that, um, we want to make sure that she recognizes the risks in there and is, is having some open communica communication. Um, we also want to work with landlords who have housing units or apartments um, in more than one location um, so that we can actually, if there's some risks, that maybe we can help um, facilitate um, a movement from one unit to another should it become necessary. Um, and particularly when we're in um, geographically isolated areas, that might be a more challenging option. So as a bottom line, as we, as we honor survivors' choices, um, we want to recognize that the power and control tactics um, commonly used by abusive partners undermine the ability of the survivor to make basic decisions sometimes. Um, for themselves and their children. And, and even though they may be, may be making choices that we don't necessarily agree with, um, we need to respect those choices um, and, and really be involved in ways that support them, um, even though they're, they may make choices that we don't necessarily agree with. Um, so if if a survivor is choosing an area or a neighborhood that may be um, more accessible to the abuser, um, we really want to help her to think through the multiple ways that um, safety can play out. And we want to do that before she locks into that housing so she's going into that housing um, with her eyes open. Um, so when we think about um, um, uh, trauma-informed approaches, we want to make sure that we're open, openly discussing issues and include them in safety planning, um, ensuring survivors have connections to supports and resources that can help address trauma impacts, and also considering survivor relocation um, um, possibilities should, um, should she need to be uh, relocating into a safer area if um, risks emerge and what that strategy might be. Um, and um, in the midst of, um, you know, thinking about it from a trauma-informed approach, um, we want to think about it in a way that we're helping them to regain a sense of control over their own lives. Um, so I often think about that in our work, I want to engage her in her own process of critical thinking. 
And as a part of that critical thinking, I want to ask her, well, you know, how, how do you think this will be helpful for you? Um, what are your safety strategies or what are your concerns around safety um, with this particular unit um, or housing choice? so that she's starting to explore those options and come to her own understanding instead of me being in the position of telling her, well, this is the better choice or not a good choice, that kind of thing. I want her to figure some of that stuff out um, through, a, through a process in there. Um, so also when we think about housing first, um, that through the work that we do, we want to think about a, an approach that's that's known as housing first, and when we think about that, part of what we, what, part, a component of that is that we're working in a way to provide um, financial assistance to help that survivor um, with some of the resources, the financial types of resources that that survivor might need um, to help um, address um, some of the barriers that she may have at, that resulted from the violence. Um, we also want to work with landlords in ways that help the landlord understand that a survivor that's connected to a program um, may be a, a less risk than an unknown tenant um, because a program has additional resources and support that they can bring to that survivor, which could alleviate some of their concerns around um, th thinking that a survivor is going to break that lease um, and put them in a position of higher turnover costs. Um, as we're planning our rental subsidies with survivors, um, another part in there is that we really want to think about how we're planning that to pro provide the longest period of time of support possible. So when we think about transitional housing, we have um, a minimum of six months that we can provide rental subsidies up to a maximum of 24 months. And what we know from our experience in working with um, victims of domestic violence and sexual assault is that the longer we can be engaged with them, the more effective our program is. So we want to try and, you know, move away from staying towards the edge of that minimum and in you know that six to nine months and moving to a year to a year and a half and even up to 24 months with a survivor to really give opportunity for people to have solid footing. Um, we also want to um, look at how, um, how we can build relationships um, with landlords and property managers um, who recognize the role that um, safe housing plays for survivors and that they're willing and ready to be a part of that. Um, and we want to link survivors to credit repair options if credit history is a problem for them and other means to address damage to their financial status standing that resulted from the abuser options. So, um, so we want to think about um, marketing to landlords. So when we talk about all of these different ways um, of working with landlords, one of the clear things when we're, when we're dealing with such limited housing stock, it's critical for us to build our options for housing by having strong relationships with a few, a few um, property owners in our area. And so marketing is, a, is going to be a critical part of that. And for us, we really want to think about what is it that landlords are going to want to know. Um, and as a part of that, how can we alleviate some of their concerns? So when we think about that marketing work, our work is going to include at looking at how, how the landlords work and are they doing pre-screening and how we are making, helping um, um, survivors get connected to, um, to landlords. So if we know a landlord's got a really big concern about a criminal background check or a credit history, 
we want to we want to do some pre-screening with that with that survivor to uncover that information so that we can be the most effective advocate. So if we're talking about um, credit history stuff, is this credit history stuff that's predated um, the abusive relationship, or is this ha happened as a result of the abusive relationship? Um, because that means two different things. Um, so if it predated, then this particular tenant, um, this particular survivor, may have a longer challenge in addressing um, financial management issues that the landlord is concerned about. Um, but if it happened as a result of the violence, then it's one of those situations where we could actually advocate and say that as a result of the violence, that this abuse was um, in responsible for some of what happened here, and this particular person had a pr prior history that worked really well, and with the proper supports would be able to recover from this. So would not necessarily be a high risk to the landlord um, because of their prior history predating the abuse. Um, and so that would be that might be a helpful way to communicate to landlords so that they can understand uh, and alleviate some of their fears. Also being able to help the landlord recognize that families will receive some education and support from the program and being able to let the landlord, landlord knows what that is and how we're going to be involved with that particular family in ways that can create some safety um, as well as um, activities that can stabilize the household, which in the long run with the landlord, if we think about their concerns around the turnover expenses, that particular area for them to understand and know that they, you know, after the subsidy is gone, that they may have a stable tenant that may stay for several years could be a selling factor for them. Um, so knowing um, what our support services are, how they're offered, who offers them, um, because we ourselves and our programs don't offer all those support services. Um, so we use a whole range of different resources that we put together. So again, as we're working with landlords, we're not talking specifically about this family, about their situation of they're going to receive all these services, but we want to educate them about these are the things that we offer to families, and as we're working with this family, this is the kind of the menu of services that can be available. Um, and we might also want to talk a little bit about some of our program's history and our successes. So if we have some history with our transitional housing program where we can say that out of, you know, 15 families that we worked with, you know, 75, 80% of our, our families were stable and stayed in their housing, you know, up to three to five years after our, our program stopped our services. That's a huge selling point. Um, again, that's a stable, that's a stable um, tenant when we, when we think about it from a landlord's, landlord's perspective. So for us, then, we want to be documenting that I know we do some follow-up with programs for a short, with uh, participants for a short period of time, um, but we want to think about how do we know whether or not um, participants have stayed longer than that, so that we can tell some of those success, successes um, and uh, represent that back to the landlords. And then we can also offer some support um, to partnering with landlords, and we want to think about what that might be um, of how we're going to provide some form of support um, in that partnership. And so one of those things that I think about in terms of support, I've mentioned turnover costs as being high, and a portion of turnover costs is about the advertisement and um, trying to fill apartments. And so maybe we're working with one household and that landlord might find that we're a good partner and as a part of that can call us and say, I have a unit here. I have a house that, 
a house that opened up or an apartment that opened up, which then instead of us always being running around trying to find another space, through that partnership, the landlord might find it convenient to be able to reach out to us and we can, um, when we have somebody that's looking for housing, help them um, by making a good referral to them. <clears throat> So another aspect of that work that we're doing, that um, marketing to landlords or that outreach and building those partnerships with landlords, is we want to develop some materials. And in developing those materials, there's a range of different things that we can provide them. We can provide them a brochure. Um, we can provide informational handouts. So we can, we can go through and identify a whole range of different things that we hear landlords are concerned about, and with an informational handout, we can help break that down. So we can talk about through um, working with our organization how we can help them find people to fill um, vacancies. We can help work with stabilizing households in their units to help maintain longer um, tenant occupancy rates um, with the participants that are coming from our program. Um, and we could provide them in basic information about homelessness and um, about dynamics of domestic violence. We could provide them some of the education tools that HUD provides um, on their website around housing and homelessness and the Violence Against Women Act. And, um, safety for victims and um, some of those kinds of things as well. We would want to provide them our business cards. Um, we um, might want to talk a little bit about what our program is about, um, which with that might identify um, the range of different services that a survivor might have. And then if we have um, some survivor stories that where they have had very successful um, experiences, not necessarily with this landlord, but with having stable housing and what it, how it changed their life. Having a couple, um, you know, two, three, four anonymous stories that can be shared can also be helpful. So I think about that as having a packet um, that we can, as we're working with landlords, that we can give to them. Um, and help them to understand about why they would want to work with us. I just want to stop um, there for just a minute and see if there's any questions or comments based on any of what, um, what I've talked about so far. So you can put your any questions or comments in the chat box or you can click on the small arm icon up in the top left corner. And that will also show us that you have uh, something to say. Okay, it looks like maybe there aren't any at this point. If you do have some, um, go ahead and you know add it to the chat, and I'll just keep moving along, and we'll catch up to you in a minute. Um, so continuing to talk about rental assistance. So as a part of what we offer, um, I had mentioned about the length of our programs, and it's an, as it at as it being an important part to provide a longer period of time um, to work with the households to really, to really um, be able to engage long-term um, stability for survivors. So another aspect of that is to think about the rental assistance that we provide. And um, people talk about um, different ways that we create rental structures and, um, and, and that will vary from program to program. And um, so we want to think about one challenge around creating a cliff effect 
where a household might find it difficult after a period of time to manage um, the cost of rent when the subsidy abruptly ends. Um, so, um, and so with that, it actually can, you know, kind of come back and create some risk um, for homelessness after a subsidy end abrupt, ends abruptly. So I want to talk about um, the fixed subsidy, which tends to create that risk of uh, a cliff effect and a declining subsidy. Uh, because I know with many of the tribal programs I've talked with over time have said, oh, I didn't know that we could, that we could vary the, the way we do the subsidy. So when we think about a, de a declining subsidy, so basically we will start at a higher level and sometimes paying full rent, and then it decreases over time. So that declining, and it can also be called like stepping it down, um, and so one of the things about doing something like that is we want to create a, a schedule so there's predictability um, for participants or for the survivors um, so they can plan and um, manage their own personal finances and know when it's going to step down or decline for them. So what it does is it provides some predictability and some um, gives them some way to know that how things are going to change. And it also, um, as a part of that, um, it allows them not to end up in that sudden drop off or that cliff, of, cliff effect uh, after, so if say they were in the program for 12 months or 18 months, and then all of a sudden abruptly that rental subsidy end, it allows them not to um, suffer that um, harsh, uh, harsh shut off of, of rental subsidies. So if you think about what people are paying for rent, whether that's $700 or $1,200, um, when you're living with very limited means, um, having, having all of a sudden to pay that type of a, a cost um, after not having to pay it for that um, 12 months or, or 18 months, um, that's going to be a sudden hardship to the household. So that's, that um, declining subsidy can be really helpful. Um, Redwind, we also have uh, an advocate program that we operate, and we provide transitional housing. And we, um, we do a step-down process that happens every three months. Um, and um, and so when people come into the program and um, we're setting in place the rental subsidy, um, we will work with them and create um, a chart that shows them, you know, um, month one, two, and three will be this rate, month four, five, and six will be this rate, and we step it down a few hundred dollars a month depending on what their starting point was. The other thing I think that's another important piece in there is that we also build into our budget um, a funding for when um, we have somebody who has a, has a loss of income. And so we, we, it's critical for us to have participants that have income as a tenant um, in our transitional housing program. And so um, we work closely with them on a assisting them with um, job readiness and securing a job and supports when in, in a new job, um, things like that to help stabilize their um, earning capacity. And we also have funding to address the fact that somebody may have, um, for whatever reasons, need to change their job and may have a loss of income for a month or two. So we build in our budget the ability to manage that for three months. So that, say for instance, they were stepping down and midway had this job loss or job change where they went one or two months or three months without an income, then we could go bring that subsidy back up to full payment um, temporarily um, until income was secured again. 
So briefly, when we think about a fixed subsidy, um, which I've alluded to some of this already, is that um, there is a little bit of positive in that, in the sense of um, the fixed subsidy where it may allow people to save money. Um, and at the same time, it could be a little bit of a challenge if people are not good savers and are, are still struggling with some financial management issues. Um, but um, so we want to think about um, how, you know, what's the pluses and um, drawbacks between both ways. Um, and as we think about a fixed subsidy, also thinking about the households with zero income or very little income, it actually makes that um, rental situation more affordable for a longer period of time that would allow them to um, stabilize and get um, more ready for um, earning capacity as opposed to a temporary short fix. Um, so there are a few possibilities or a few options in there that could be positive in doing a fixed subsidy. Um, and the huge drawback of the fixed subsidy is that cliff effect. So as we think about other financial assistance, we also want to think about um, things such as application fees, housing search assistance, um, any kinds of deposits that may be necessary to get um, the housing, and then household setup. Um, so as we're developing our transitional housing budgets, um, we want to make sure we've planned for some of those costs. Um, some landlords um, or property um, properties may request uh, 25 to up to $50 application fee each time. And if they don't get into it, they don't get the application fee back. So they could conceivably spend 100 to up to $200 applying to different units or different properties and before they actually secure something. And so particularly because the population we're working with are low income, we want to make sure that um, we remove as many barriers as possible. Um, housing search assistance, um, so more so this is less than a um, financial assistance and more so a staffing assistance. And this is where we've built some of our landlord relationships and we can help them get connected to openings that might be there within our landlord relationships or even um, doing cold searches um, for housing options in the community um, in our area. Um, and then also deposits. So housing and utility deposits um, can, can be barriers and sometimes can be quite high. Sometimes a landlord um, may ask for first and last month's rent. Um, so that means that the cost of a deposit being last month's rent um, is, is the cost of a full month's rent. With it, if they're paying $1,000 a month for rent, um, that's a, quite a high utility deposit um, or a, quite a high housing deposit, I mean. And then utility deposits could range from, um, you know, nothing upwards to a few hundred dollars. That can also be barriers um, to getting in and getting situated. So we want to help with that. Um, we also um, help uh, families with household setup. So our, you know, thinking about our families coming from a homeless situation, um, they're not, you know, bouncing around um, homeless, dragging a couch around with them or a bed. Um, so most of the time they just have clothing and need just about everything to set up their household. And um, there's a whole different range of different ways to get donations um, to bring those things back um, to help people with those different kinds of options. I do want to talk a little bit about the Violence Against Women Act. Um, VAWA has some housing provisions um, to work at um, creating safety for survivors. And when we think about it, it's intended um, 
uh, to encourage survivors who are receiving housing subsidies to report and seek help um, for the abuse com committed against them without being afraid of being evicted. Um, they also protect individuals applying for or living in federally subsidized housing from being discriminated against because of acts of domestic violence, sexual assault, stalking, and, and dating violence, um, the four major crimes that VAWA covers. Um, and then it basically applies to survivors regardless of age, sex, gender, identity, or sexual orientation. And so that means most of the time we're working with male or female survivors, and it also applies to uh, male survivors as well. Um, and the caveat in here is that it only applies to federal housing programs. And so um, when I say federal housing programs, um, this particular slide has a whole list of different housing programs that VAWA applies to. And in particular, what we know um, when we think about uh, these different housing programs, w within our tribal communities, McKinney-Vento Act homeless programs, the Rural Development Multifamily Housing and the Low Income Housing Tax Credit tends to be the predominant housing funding that comes into our tribal housing authorities. Um, as we're working with private landlords, though, um, we may find that some of this other housing may have subsidized um, some portion of uh, some of the private landlord owning the property managers and um, um, private landlords um, units. So being able to understand that, that this covers that is an important part. The other thing that's when we think about our tribal housing authorities, the other thing that's really important for us to recognize is that VAWA does not cover NAHASDA. Um, NAHASDA is the Native American Housing Assistance and Self-Determination Act of 1996, which within NAHASDA covers the Indian Housing Block Grant and the Title VI, uh, which provides market rate loans to tribal housing authorities to develop housing. So it does not cover NAHASDA. And many people will say, well, then tribal housing doesn't fit under VAWA. Well, I mentioned before that McKinney-Vento, the Rural Development um, Multifamily Housing and the Low Income Housing Tax Credits can also show up in tribal housing. So as tribal tri the tribal housing authorities are developing housing, um, they're putting together a package of funding oftentimes. So they may have a large portion in there of NAHASDA funding, but if they have $1 from any one of these other funding sources on this slide, then VAWA applies to that property. Um, and so that's an important piece to understand. And I was working with one tribe where um, they were struggling with trying to get the Tribal Housing Authority to recognize the, how, the, the VAWA housing protections or how, housing provisions. And um, in talking with them, um, <clears throat> the particular housing that this, the survivor was in that they were working at helping did not have any of these other funding sources. They only had NAHASDA funding in there. But because of all the other funding that they had where they had mixed funding in there, um, one of the things that that Tribal Housing Authority decided to do, um, because it would have been harder for them to have um, rules and policies in this unit that was different than another unit, um, they decided to recognize VAWA housing pr provisions across all their housing whether it was NAHASDA only or NAHASDA plus these other funding sources. So that's important to know um, because you can work with your tribal housing authority um, to help them to understand that distinction and uh, recognize it's going to save them some uh, time and energy as they look at how to, um, how to implement VAWA.
So when we think about, um, so again, thinking about VAWA and how it protects. So basically, a survivor cannot be denied admission or federal rental assistance just because they're a victim or a threatened victim of domestic violence. Um, they cannot be evicted or lose their federal renting, rental assistance just, the, just because they are or have been a victim or a threatened victim of domestic violence. Um, they cannot be denied admission or rental assistance, evicted or lose their subsidy for reasons related to the abuse, such as bad credit, credit history or criminal history. So what I was talking about earlier about if the bad credit history happened during the abuse, you could draw the connection to the fact that that happened as a result of the abuse and not talking about bad credit history that predates the abuse. Um, and the same thing with cr criminal history. Um, so as a part of that, as a part of looking at the housing provisions um, through VAWA, one of the things that's really important is to recognize that through HUD, uh, or through VAWA 2013, it required that HUD create a certification form that serves as a means of documenting the incident or incidents of domestic violence, dating violence, sexual assault, or stalking. And so as a, as a part of proving that, um, when they prove um, that they're a victim of domestic violence, or how they prove that they're a victim of domestic violence, um, they, they have a form that basically is a simple one-page form. Um, and when you think about eligibility within your program, um, that often um, within your eligibility, you can take a victim statement that says, states what happened um, and then they can attest to it by signing off on it. Um, so the HUD certification, the certification and documentation, um, is, is very similar to that. Um, just as what you would do with eligibility, you can take a victim statement. You, you use this form that they provide, um, and, um, and it basically it's a very simple thing where they're identifying themselves providing dates, and then they're providing a statement, and they're attesting to the accuracy of what they're saying. Um, they also, so also through this certification and documentation, um, it's acceptable to have a victim services program um, provide documentation that this person is in fact a victim. So an emergency shelter, your crisis program um, can also provide a statement and attest to uh, the fact that they're a victim. Um, and then additionally, um, the victim can provide other documentation, again, connecting it to how we do that through, um, through eligibility determinations that we already do with our program. What we can also do then is um, the vic help the victim provide a police report, provide a protection order, um, provide a medical documentation, some other um, you know emergency type response that demonstrates that this is in fact a victim of of one of the four major crimes: domestic violence, sexual assault, um, dating violence, and stalking. Um, the important thing to recognize is that under these circumstances that the onus is on the victim to request um, um, VAWA uh, protection um, and not um, the provider, the housing provider. So um, the victim needs to go in and say, um, you know, I. I can't be evicted. This is this happened because of domestic abuse, um, and provide the documentation that demonstrates that they're a victim.
So um, I also just really want us to think about, as we're doing this work, that um, all survivors are different. And um, there's a lot of uniqueness from one person to the other, and there's also similarities. And going back to that we want to approach our work that's trauma-informed, um, we also want to uh, uh, approach our work in a way that's relative-centered. And um, what I mean by that is that we recognize all of our all of the survivors as our relatives and that we work with them within the uniqueness of them and their families individually with what they need and what their choices are and we support them um, to find their way to find their best options um, and um, help them connect to the resources that they need um, and that's going to be a whole range of things also, as we're working with landlords, um, we also want to recognize that one landlord is going to have a different approach and a different mentality than, a different, than another landlord. So just because we've approached one landlord and we've hit a wall, um, we may want to give that some time to rest for a while and find another landlord um, because they themselves are also different. Um, and yet at the same time, we all have um, humanity within us and we have some concerns and caring um, for our communities and the healing of our community. Um, so as we're doing this work, it's going to require that us as advocates engage um, persistently. That means that um, we don't give up. We keep working at it. We keep building it. Um, we tap into the passion that drives us to do this work to help survivors be safe, help survivors have a good life, um, and, um, and we're patient along the way. Um, change doesn't happen overnight. Um, once in a while we get really lucky and it does. Um, but, w but as we're building our responses and building our relationships with landlords and our options for survivors, it's going to require that we're patient with the process. We're patient with ourselves and gentle with ourselves as we um, try new things out and step forward to um, find the options for survivors and build those resources. And over time, uh, we're going to see the fruits of our labor, and they're going to come about and bring us um, many options. So I want to stop here again and see if we have any questions or comments. Remember that you can put it in the chat box, or you can click on the arm icon in the top left. While you're thinking about that, I do want to remind you that in um, the files box, um, there is a, um, a resource in there. It's called Rapid Rehousing, um, which has some good information and covers a lot of stuff about what I talked about. Um, so that might be a helpful resource for you as you go forward. Um, also, you've got my contact information on the slide, so you can send me an email. Um, to reach out to me with any questions you might have as you're walking forward in your work. All right, well, if we don't have any questions, then we will start wrapping up. Thank you, Vicki, for presenting, and thank you, Anna, for hosting. Uh, I would like to remind you all that we do still have two webinars coming up. The first one is building partnerships with your tribal housing authority, and that will be on the 15th of next month at uh, 12 p.m. Mountain Time. And then we also have women's education groups 
on the 5th of June. And that will also be at 12 p.m. Mountain Time. And that one will be our last webinar. I would also like to remind you that Redwind has a forum on its website. The uh, grantees and any coalitions or anything like that can access. And it's a place where these grantees can talk to each other and get uh, information and uh, directly connect. Uh, and that is at redwind.net. And I would also like to remind you that if uh, registration for our Sexual Assault Training Institute is up on our website, along with our technical or er, transitional housing uh, conference that is coming up in May. And those are both going to be on the website where you can register. So I would like once again to thank our presenter and our host, and I would like to thank all of you for being here. And I hope you all have a wonderful day. Thanks, Sanobi.